Hello, my name is Ray Edmonds. Welcome to my watercolor workshop. Today I'm giving a full demonstration of a painting from Peggy's Cove in Nova Scotia. I invite you to enjoy me. Well, this is the first thing that we uh, are going to look at. This is the painting that I'll be doing. Uh, so first of all, as you look at the sketch, I pre-sketched this to save time since it's a long video. And also, um, it's going to be sped up uh, double time. And so you'll see uh, some, not only the sketch marks, but you'll see some uh, uh, of the masking that's been placed on the paper to save the white so that we can paint right over them and uh, then peel that masking fluid off later, and the white of the paper will still be there. So that's what we're doing now. We're sort of wetting the background so that you can, uh, that we can float some wet into wet paint into the background. Uh, you may be able to see some of the water. I slightly tinted it blue. Now I'm applying um, cobalt blue and a little mixture of ultramarine blue at, at times. Floating it in, letting it run on its own. The board, my drafting table, is slightly tilted uh, toward the bottom of the picture to give it a little movement. I'm also mixing in a little burnt sienna and a little violet, I think it's uh, ultramarine violet, just to give it some color. Now a little bit more burnt sienna floated into it. Now as you'll see, it, uh, it begins to look the sky a little dark uh, when actually we'll get back to that near the end of the painting it's not nearly as dark as it looks now because when it dries it's going to dry much lighter tilting the board uh, not only a little catacornered there but also uh, it's tilted like that so that it runs toward this corner which you can't see on the camera at the moment. The clouds are sort of running down toward that left hand corner of the page. I'm holding it up so it increased the flow a little more. Uh, I like to, in my skies, I like to uh, hold them uh, in different angles letting the water run back and forth. Right now the water is accumulated down near the house tops and so I've taken a dry brush. You didn't see it but off screen. I took a dry brush, wiped the brush and lifted some of the water. I'm tilting it the opposite direction now to let it flow back a little bit. Uh, now I've taken the tissue and dried the brush with my left hand and I'm lifting a few of the white clouds from the painting. The sky is not the important part of this painting although it does serve its purpose um, as you'll see a little later. So it's not meant to be too dramatic. Now I'm floating in the water of the harbor I'm using uh, ultramarine blue with a little cobalt mixed in with it. What we're doing now of course is just laying in the first washes of the painting, uh, the underlayment, defining the shapes, painting around some of the areas now the shadow of that boat, I'm leaving white at the moment. We 
I could have put uh, masking fluid there to preserve that, probably should have. Uh, I'm not a great fan of using too much masking fluid. It's a great tool for some people. Uh, I'd rather paint around at times. Gradually darkening some of the water, getting the right values at this stage is important. You can put another layer or glaze on top of these after they dry. This is all still wet and the, the harbor water there is still wet. You can see the advantage of putting a masking fluid and painting right over the boat and over the figure there at the bottom. Um, this helps to preserve that white for later on. Many times in landscapes I, I won't put a masking fluid down, but certainly with um, all the objects in this one. Painting a little of the foreground there, that's the uh, uh, walkway where the artist has set up her palette. The colors in this picture are, are really very few. Uh, ultramarine blue, cobalt blue, uh, burnt sienna, a little bit of permanent red and carmine mixed later on very little of that uh, the the darks the what looks like blacks are mixed with ultramarine blue and burnt sienna and a little violet painting the roofs most of the roofs are dark color um, not sure they really are in Peggy's Cove been there a number of times but uh, what the dark roofs tend to do is establish a darker value. They look darker against the lighter sky, of course. You can see why we fast forward. A lot of this is small detail work. Uh, even at a fast pace, you can follow along pretty well. This is a light coating of, ultim of um, burnt sienna. Just laying in a flat wash across the building. Details will come later. Other colors can be floated in on uh, in a flat wash like this sometimes as a base coat. Painting around the openings in the building. Not completely necessary because they'll all be very dark. Uh, could have just not taken the time to paint around, just painted over them and then later came on with a dark color. Now in the shaded side, uh, the brighter color of that uh, building is beginning to come out. A little more color to that base, that's, that side of the building is dry. I tend to work uh, certain areas, um, but usually all over the picture as uh, as well. Um, you don't want to get uh, too hung up in one area of the painting and begin to work too much detail into it. Um, right now I'm basically establishing values of light and darkness. you can see with my palette there, I'm not using a lot of color. Um, it's all 
within those several colors. These are the shaded sides of those buildings, of course, the darker sides. And all of that, again, is to establish the values. The values between 1 and 10 would be something like uh, 6 or 7, uh, except the roofs. The roofs probably are the darkest value in the painting so far. Usually I don't paint this small. I like to paint larger paintings. This is about uh, uh, 10 by 13. The I like to paint on a half sheet of paper. 15 by 22 thereabouts or a full sheet of 22 by 30. Um, To me, it takes about as much time to paint a small painting as it does a large. Although when you're beginning, of course, uh, larger sizes intimidate you. Now I'm shading in under the dock with a darker value. Again, the same colors, burnt sienna, uh, ultramarine blue, and touch of violet, sometimes a little Payne's gray, establishing the form of the dock underneath the wharf. Off camera you can't see but there's in my left hand I have a uh, some paper towels that I will adjust the moisture that I've just gotten from my palette. I'll take some of the paint off depending on where I'm going to put it. Uh, the amount of paint and the amount of water of course controls the uh, the intensity of your color. Blocking in some of the forms now, the small forms in the background. Gradually, usually in watercolor, we work from the back, the far distance to the to the front, to the foreground. Not always the case, but uh, usually that's best because it's very difficult to paint things in the foreground then to have to paint things behind them particularly back as far as the sky or distant objects um, you really cannot run those distant objects into the foreground objects if you overlap lines uh, it sort of destroys the the image of distance. Still blocking in all of these small shapes. This is a mixture of uh, red, permanent red, and uh, I think uh, alizarin crimson. And back on the main largest building there, it's burnt sienna with maybe a touch of red. Sometimes it's easier to turn the paper sideways if you're trying to stay within certain lines, if their lines are important. Uh, it's a little easier to do that. You might notice that I'm, my hand is resting on a stick. Uh, this is similar to what the oral painters uh, may use, uh, but this is what I call a bridge. I'm not sure what others call it. It's just a, a firm piece of wood, uh, small. This one's about an inch and a half 
wide. Um, any thickness will do. I prefer a thin piece of wood. Uh, this one's about a half inch thick. And on either end of it, there is about a quarter inch piece. You can't see that from the angle, the picture at the moment. But that keeps it off the surface, keeps the board off the surface of the picture and serves as a little rest for my hand. Other artists use other tricks. Sometimes I'll use just a piece of paper if the if the picture is dry, uh, certain parts of a dry, I'll just use a picture, a piece of paper. But this little bridge comes in handy, keeps your hand off the paper. You don't want the oils of your hand to touch the paper because that will influence the water uh, and the color, particularly if that area has not been painted. You may not see it if it's if it's white uh, or or that goes any color, you may not see those oils, but they do affect the colors that come later. Now I'm beginning to do a little detail work on the windows of the building. Uh, all this is a little time consuming. Uh, this is sort of a semi-realistic style. It's not as impressionistic uh, as some you were painting this in a larger format and sort of impressionistic, you wouldn't perhaps spend as much time uh, on these little details. But uh, I felt they were necessary in this painting. A lot of hard lines, not so many soft edges. I do like soft edges, but it's uh, painting this far in the distance. Uh, the soft edges are a little more difficult to to have in there. It's not too exciting watching uh, someone paint details, but uh, hopefully you can get something from this. Now we're going to paint in the side, some of the siding, give it a little texture. Spending more time with that building because that's the largest building. Uh, and so the texture on that building will be more obvious than those in the background. I tend not to use too many colors in paintings. I've got uh, a full palette of, of paint, but and some of them are very pretty, but the kind of paintings that I do, um, usually the colors are rather muted. And uh, burnt sienna, ultramarine blue, uh, yellow ochre, which I haven't used in this painting. Uh, and. Uh, a few yellows uh, and a, a, just a basic red cobalt blue those are sort of my standard colors uh, I do have a violet mauve but I tend to uh, paint evening scenes or uh, landscapes and uh, don't like a lot of garish colors. I've seen some very beautiful watercolors with some beautiful colors, but it just doesn't suit my subject matter very often. To say this is not the exciting part to watch uh, detailing 
but you can gradually see the picture, I would think, come forward. It begins what some artists say begins to pop. It's the little things that make it uh, begin to take shape from... Uh, obviously you could tell what this was from the beginning because I sketched it a little darker than I normally would sketch for uh, my paintings. So you could see uh, what the painting was. Sometimes um, you can't tell what a watercolor is going to be until you're halfway through. Spending perhaps a little too long on the video on the windows and the detail there uh, will speed up in just a moment or two. Painting watercolors is a constant process of looking at your values um, because, as you know, if you're a watercolorist, the, uh, as the painting dries in watercolors, they, the paint gets lighter, uh, which changes the values, and only experience will sort of give you the guidance to know how dark it is to put on. There's nothing wrong with uh, going back in after it's dry and laying another glaze of color over it to darken it. But if possible, I like to get on the first uh, wash a the darkest value that I need for that area. I don't like really to do too much glazing uh, it depends, of course, on the subject matter and where you where you're painting. I do a lot of glazing and landscape work. Well, still filling, filling in some of the background detail. A lot of small objects in this. In a larger painting, I would often just uh, show those in uh, rather uh, faded value or form. Um, but this one... Uh, I wanted to show you some of the other techniques, so I, I guess I put in more than I needed. <coughs> Mixing some paint now. I'm going to Go in and put in the roof of that building in the foreground. Feel like I need to sing a song once in a while, but I know I know you don't want me to do that. You'll turn this channel off right away. Now you, when we've added that darker roof there, you'll, it begins to uh, establish some of the foreground of the picture. Uh, and I think you'll see when we begin to work on the boat and the artist painting in the, at the uh, foreground there, things will come forward. We've been spending a lot of the time, about 20 minutes or so, dealing with uh, laying in shapes in the background. But they're gradually coming forward now, beginning to work on the boat.
This is a very typical harbor scene, by the way. They're one of the most photographed areas of the eastern Atlantic coast. Nova Scotia, of course, is a paradise for artists and photographers. And Peggy's Cove is one of those areas that uh, has a, this is a very familiar scene. Anyone who's been there should recognize it. And often you will see an artist standing there or sitting, uh, sketching or painting. Many photographers. Uh, it's a tourist site which tour groups and uh, people on cruises to that area. The tour buses will bring you to this site quite often. You see me use a, a tissue or a paper towel there. Uh, that's not to correct a mistake, although you can do it if you do it quickly. Uh, sometimes when you lay a, a small wash down, you want to, it's a little too much color, and so you lift some of that wash back off the paper. I think that's what I was doing there. Now I'm shading some of the background areas. A lot of little buildings back there. So we're going to be moving forward here very soon. All of that uh, back there serves to sort of stop your eye from traveling any further up. Uh, one of the the problems with this painting that I I saw after I had reached a point of almost no return, you you can correct a lot of things in watercolor. It's supposed to be so unforgiving, but and it is to a point. You need to plan ahead uh, more, I think, in watercolors than other media. Um, but this. Uh, sky is too light for my particular uh, uh, preference. If I were doing this, I didn't discover that until all these values were in. Uh, it's a little too pale up there. And I would, at this point, had I recognized it, I could have gone back and re-wet the sky and floated in color to darken it, particularly at the top of the page. That helps to force your eye down toward the center of interest. I didn't do that, and I didn't recognize it until after I had put in some of the galls that are going to be in the picture. And once I did that, uh, that's almost a little too late. If I discover a good way, I'll show you uh, on another video that would make this video too long. It's long already, uh, but I would show you on another video of how to correct what's not really a mistake, but something that I think would improve the picture. There are techniques that you could do that. Now what you see me doing is removing the masking fluid. You almost forgot it was there, didn't you? Except that little yellow, uh, creamy kind of shape that was there. Removing the masking fluid. This particular masking fluid was a little old and was a little diff had a little difficult time getting it off. Normally it's not that sticky. Uh, but I'm removing it from the boat and then I'll remove it from the person standing, uh, the artist standing there, and then the boat in the two boats on the side, the smaller boats. Um, and if you don't know about masking fluid, there is a 
and you can use your finger, which I don't like to do if I have much of it because many times that will affect the white of the paper as well. But we have a, a masking fluid uh, eraser, so to speak. It's sort of like a, a square of the old gum shoe that uh, was popular at one time. And it, uh, of course, doesn't use it up. It stays like that forever. Uh, and it helps to rub off that fluid. And the fluid, if you haven't seen it, it's a little like a rubber cement that you can get. Uh, in fact, you can use rubber cement. Uh, it's not as good. I wouldn't advise it. Uh, there's a number of ways you can mask things off, and that's for another video, another time, if you don't are not familiar with masking. But uh, masking fluid is... Uh, uh, goes a long way and is very good substance. A number of companies make it. All the major painting companies do have one. So we've pretty well removed all of the masking fluid now. I'm going back and painting the shady side of that boat. Even though it's a white boat, it has a shaded side which because of the blue of the water has a sort of a cast shadow uh, or reflect reflected shadow rather of sort of a blue onto that as well as in the water uh, there's a little white shadow in the water as well as the blue shadow of the boat now you begin to see the boat take its and the picture take its shape things become uh, coming more and more to the foreground, which is really what it's all about. And let's just add a little trick of moving the paper around to make it the angle of your brush a little easier. Darkening the value of that side, the reflected color on that boat from the water will be lighter. It's white, of course, but it will be lighter uh, than the water itself or the reflection in the water. You need to study reflections if you're near the water. It's always good. Sometimes we take things for granted, but observing is very important in art. Uh, I have two videos out, uh, how to see shapes in nature and how to use those shapes in constructing pictures. And uh, you can see all of these are sort of basic uh, uh, squares and rectangles and uh, most things in nature are. It's just rearranging them and seeing them how to use them. Defining now the boats in the picture, that boat is a little red boat. The one toward the back is, is a little green, has some green on the bow and the side. Uh, floating in some color for it's a light light uh, brown it could be burnt umber I think it was ultramarine uh, and burnt umber uh, on the artist's easel there <clears throat> I don't do as much plein air painting that's uh, painting outdoors uh, uh, which is a great way to paint. Uh, I don't do as much because of my time schedule. But I would love to have the time to, to do it. It's the, so the best way to, to, real, to get the real colors of nature. Uh, photographs uh, are good to a point, but they really don't capture the nuances of color. Now you can see as we 
began to detail the foreground more, uh, the picture becomes gets comes forward in a sense. Uh, putting in little details of value back there which help define those buildings. Uh, the darks, intense darks help to define the lights of the sides. Help to define the shoreline. Our pictures would be rather bland and, and flat were it not for the contrasting values of dark and light. As you can see, that little bridge is a very handy thing uh, when you're working. I have several sizes of them. I make them wide enough to span most of my paintings except uh, a full sheet of 22 by 30. Uh, but I still can use it uh, on those. Just have to be sure that I don't uh, have paint on them as I put them on the painting. Now you can see the defining the shadows, reflections of those buildings does several things. Not only helps to make it a little realistic about the, the buildings, but it also, again, with the light and dark values, helps to define that bank of rocks and grass. Uh, helps to bring out the buildings themselves. And I'll be darkening some other areas of the picture. All this takes time, of course, even with small pictures. Uh, just because they're small doesn't mean it takes uh, a lot less time. You just don't have to cover as much. And new artists tend to f get intimidated by filling up the whole space, but... Uh, uh, actually, I find it's just as easy to paint large paintings uh, as it is to paint the small ones. Uh, particularly if you're going to paint a scene like this. Now, if an, a 9 by 12 or a 10 by 13 uh, sheet of paper, you were painting a single subject like a, a flower or a, a vase or a still life, of apples and bananas and so forth, uh, it uh, wouldn't be as time consuming. But when you're painting a scene, uh, a seascape or a harbor scene or a landscape, uh, there's a lot more detail in that small one. So it's a little time consuming. Detailing the woman who is the artist at that point. She was an oil painter. Uh, this was an actual scene. Uh, didn't make this up. There was a, an artist there. Uh, not sure what she was wearing that day, but uh, it's a very typical kind of dress. Uh, I didn't see what she was painting, but uh, what particular part of that harbor she was painting, whether she was painting the whole scene like we are today, or whether she was just painting the boat and the building, not quite sure. I didn't really have the time to engage in conversation with her. A little more detailing to make the boat uh, stand out and to come forward. Using the darker 
value to put the holes where the windows are in the boat. The brushes that I'm using are uh, not really expensive brushes. These particular brushes, uh, since I don't paint small too often, except for demonstrations, uh, I don't usually have a number of uh, expensive small brushes. <laughs> these, uh, these brushes are very inexpensive at most of the art stores. The size is uh, about a six. Uh, that happens to be a Royal Taclon brush. Uh, not sure where I got it, but they're available. I think these came in a pack of six, so it's not not very expensive. Um, earlier in the picture, I uh, I had a larger brush that was actually a better brush. It was a Grumbacher. Uh, golden edge brush around with a round uh, with a point rounded point uh, probably uh, only use two brushes in this painting many times I'll use just three or four in the larger paintings I will paint with a much larger brush quite common for me to paint uh, half the picture or more with a inch and a half bristle brush that lays a lot of water down at one time. I use that to wet the surface of the painting but I also use it to uh, paint with. Um, my theory is you I like to use as large a brush as possible and when I can't do what I need to do with that brush because of the smallness of the object, then I'll move down to a smaller brush. I also have another uh, principle that I try to live by, as few of strokes with the brush as possible to get the needed effect. Now, uh, this, this is a long uh, painting. Uh, as I say, I could have painted a full-size picture the same length of time as I painted this. Uh, but uh, I have, I tell my students, if one stroke will do it, then just do one stroke. But if you need to go on to two strokes for that area, then go to two strokes. If you have to go to three, then go to three. But always keep it to a minimum. There's something about watercolors, it's not like painting a, a wall or a house where you go back and over it and over it and over it, back and forth and back and forth. Uh, I feel that, that going back and forth over the same area, even though it's wet, uh, affects the, the purity and the transparency in, in a way that I prefer not to do. Now there are times when you have to do that. And one of the first things I watch with my students is they'll, they'll get the brush and they'll lay paint on and just go back and forth, back and forth over the same area. And I'll say, well, why, why are you doing that? You already have that area covered. What do you need to do several strokes for? Um, I'm what we, I call a lazy painter. If one stroke will do it, that's what I do. If I have to have two, I'll do two. But uh, keep it to a minimum. Simplify. And I think your, your painting in watercolor is much better that way. Now that may, that may not apply to the uh, orals and acrylic painting. You're always, the white of the paper is always affecting what you're doing. You don't really want to cover that up. Same way with when you put paint onto your palette from a tube or whatever you're using. Um, I find that beginning watercolor artists put too much paint on their palette. Uh, a little 
paint and watercolors will go a very long way. Uh, I put down about the head of the cap of a small tube of watercolor painting is about all I put down if I'm putting it on a fresh palette. Uh, most of my paints are kept in in a palette, in the trays in a palette. But if I'm putting out new paint on a dish or uh, an enamel pan, I will just put a small amount because a little goes a very long way. And it's very easy to, to get into the habit of, of wasting it. That's why I like to have it in a pallet, a tray on a pallet, because uh, I can lift what paint I need from it uh, and doesn't go to waste if I don't use it. And often on the pallet, my pallets are very dirty. I don't uh, clean them up too much because of the kind of uh, scenes I, I use. Uh, many times I'll use the palette is pretty dirty and I'm, I'm not alone on that there are many artists who who paint that way obviously if you're painting um, uh, objects like flowers or some other still life where the p colors need to be pretty pure then you want to make sure that uh, that much of your palette is, is clean now of course I'm darkening the area under the uh, the wharf, it looks too dark there. It will lighten up. Again, this is all part of uh, knowing how dark to lay the water color down because it's going to lighten in value. Putting in some reflections. At this point, uh, I'm lifting paint a color out rather than putting color in. Uh, that's why that area got a little lighter back there. It was a little too too much dark all in one area. So lightened up a little area that looks something like a board. Bringing it forward now, darkening the foreground. Another little tick, trick is in the foreground, the bottom of your painting uh, off many times now there's no hard and fast rules in watercolor but many times putting the a darker color of whatever color is in that uh, bottom part of your painting putting a darker value will help again frame the picture keep your eye above that which is where you want it to be uh, now, not a solid color, of course, but uh, what we would call a graded wash, or in other words, just faded from dark to light in certain areas. Working on the rocks now to, to there's a, a rock a wall there to keep the, uh, the road in place, I guess lack of a better reason. There's a lot of little details need still to go on. Um, as you put in color really is value, putting in value of light and dark value, uh, and you need to readjust other values I didn't do a pencil sketch of this scene before I started. A pencil sketch is very good because you can establish light and dark values. And it helps you, rather than have to make those decisions while you're painting, which of course you always have to adjust, but um, it s establishes those values even though it's a pencil black and white. Uh, if you have a photograph and you have your own printer on a computer, often a good trick would be if you had this scene on a photograph, would be to turn that 
scene into a black and white photograph and print that so that you have that. That establishes the value. And the value of the, is the most important uh, element of a picture. The color is is nice. It helps it make more realistic. But really it's the light and dark areas that makes the picture have its full oomph and, and uh, as I say, pop off the page. Now we're getting very close to the end at, the, at this point. Still got uh, more detail to put in, but you can see the painting coming forward all the time. Well, as you can see, we're still putting in details in the foreground here. Uh, all of this will be beginning to make the uh, picture come forward. And uh, yes, there. Just adding little things here and there to make the picture come forward now. It's all this small detail that takes some amount of time, but that's what, uh, in the end, shows up everything. Adding some shadows now on those small boats back there. Darkening some of the values of the shadow of the boat. Bringing some of those shadows across the reflection. Um, some of the wave reflections give it a little more realistic look. Darkening the water a little bit in, in the foreground helps also to cause your eye to stop down there, but it's also uh, more realistic. Water is usually darker. The closer it gets to you and you look down, it reflects the sky more than the distant water. comes a point in every watercolor when the watercolorist has to, or any painter has to decide when to stop. Uh, at this point I'm still adding some detail here and there. You don't want to overwork it. don't want to make it too precise. But every time you add some value one place it sort of affects values everywhere and that's why you see the adjustment back and forth across the painting. For a viewer, of course, it uh, becomes a little tedious, but if you're an artist, this is what you need to do to keep bringing the picture out. And put a frame on there. Now I'm taking off the masking tape around which borders it. Helps to frame it a little bit more and you get a better idea of what it's like. Um, we're not finished at this point. There are some other more details uh, that needs to be done. Just darkening some areas, giving a little more value to it. Uh, a little more value to adding a little red wash over that building. Uh, putting a little bit of light color um, don't use white paint too often, but 
uh, you can either scrape those light shadows of, of those pilings or use a little bit of white wash white watercolor just enough to highlight it slightly uh, and that's what I'm doing here just highlighting certain little areas Now uh, we skip forward a little bit in the in the painting to uh, because it is a long video. Uh, put in some gulls in the sky, and this is where I made my mistake. I would have darkened the sky a little more. That would have done two things: would have helped uh, frame the upper part of the painting, and it also would have given me a dark contrast to show the white of the gulls. Uh, as it is, the gulls don't stand out as much as they need to. And uh, there's not much you can do about that. Uh, you can outline them in a darker color. Uh, but uh, they actually sort of disappeared there as I put some white gouache over them. But uh, then I later went back and uh, highlighted them with some darker colors so you could see them. Now these are some fine final details, adding a little grass on that hillside. Uh, now you see, rather than use a bridge, I'm using a piece of watercolor paper to lay my hand on. Uh, and I can do that because all that painting there is dry. Uh, many times artists will do that. Just about to the end of this watercolor. Just little things to help it come off the page. Could have done this off camera showing you the final result but it's only fair to see uh, as an artist sees as they get close to the end of their painting uh, what they feel they need to do to to make it a little bit more have a little more pizzazz uh, a little more eye-popping thing uh, so darkening certain areas this is all comes into value darkening certain areas and uh, part of the part of why it takes took me so long to establish the values that I finally wanted here uh, was not so much the colors it was the light and darkness and that's because I didn't do a pencil sketch of this scene before I started had I done that I would have been much more deliberate planning ahead in a watercolor is is critical step um, some artists can visualize the entire painting uh, before they even start they know what it's going to look like uh, in their minds before they even start that's quite a, uh, a good technique to work toward a skill really to work toward think ahead plan it all out in your mind before you began to touch the watercolor. In, in oils and acrylics and gouache, you can, uh, you can always correct those mistakes by painting over them, but you really can't do much of that in watercolors. There are a few things you can do, but uh, it's very, very, very few. Well, we're right at the end now of our watercolor, and this is the final picture, uh, the final painting. I hope you've liked it. Well, I'm glad you've joined me for this time together. I hope you enjoyed that full demonstration of a watercolor painting. Uh, if you've liked it, 
please let me know in the comment section below. Uh, also, if you want to subscribe to my channel to get all the, the videos that I'll be producing, um, it's Ray Edmonds on the YouTube, cha on the YouTube channel, Ray Edmonds. Um, and I'll be happy to take your suggestions and offer videos that would help you. Thank you for joining me today.